The most anxious period of the war, to me, was during the time the Army of the Tennessee was guarding the territory acquired by the fall of Corinth and Memphis, and before I was sufficiently reinforced to take the offensive. The enemy also had cavalry operating in our rear, making it necessary to guard every point of the railroad back to Columbus, on the security of which we were dependent for all our supplies. Headquarters were connected by telegraph with all points of the command except Memphis and the Mississippi below Columbus. With these points communication was had by the railroad to Columbus, then down the river by boat. To reinforce Memphis would take three or four days, and to get an order there for troops to move elsewhere would have taken at least two days. Memphis therefore was practically isolated from the balance of the command. But it was in Sherman's hands. Then, too, the troops were well entrenched and the gunboats made a valuable auxiliary. During the two months after the departure of General Halleck, there was much fighting between small bodies of the contending armies, but these encounters were dwarfed by the magnitude of the main battles so as to be now almost forgotten, except by those engaged in them. Some of them, however, estimated by the losses on both sides in killed and wounded, were equal in hard fighting to most of the battles of the Mexican War, which attracted so much of the attention of the public when they occurred. About the 23rd of July, Colonel Ross, commanding at Bolivar, was threatened by a large force of the enemy so that he had to be reinforced from Jackson and Corinth. On the 27th, there was skirmishing on the Hatchie River, eight miles from Bolivar. On the 30th, I learned from Colonel P. H. Sheridan, who had been far to the south, that Bragg in person was at Rome, Georgia, with his troops moving by rail, by way of Mobile, to Chattanooga and his wagon train marching overland to join him at Rome. Price was at this time at Holly Springs, Mississippi, with a large force and occupied Grand Junction as an outpost. I proposed to the General-in-Chief to be permitted to drive him away, but was informed that, while I had to judge for myself, the best use to make of my troops was not to scatter them, but hold them ready to reinforce Buell. The movement of Bragg himself with his wagon trains to Chattanooga across country, while his troops were transported over a long roundabout road to the same destination, without need of guards except when in my immediate front, demonstrates the advantage which troops enjoy while acting in a country where the people are friendly. Buell was marching through a hostile region and had to have his communications thoroughly guarded back to a base of supplies. More men were required the farther the national troops penetrated into the enemy's country. I, with an army sufficiently powerful to have destroyed Bragg, was purely on the defensive and accomplishing no more than to hold a force far inferior to my own. On the 2nd of August, I was ordered from Washington to live upon the country, on the resources of citizens hostile to the government, so far as practicable. I was also directed to handle rebels within our lines without gloves, to imprison them, or to expel them from their homes and from our lines. I do not recollect having arrested and confined a citizen, not a soldier, during the entire rebellion. I am aware that a great many were sent to northern prisons, particularly to Joliet, Illinois, by some of my subordinates with the statement that it was my order. I had all such released the moment I learned of their arrest, and finally sent a staff officer north to release every prisoner who was said to be confined by my order. There were many citizens at home who deserved punishment because they were soldiers when an opportunity was afforded to inflict an injury to the national cause. This class was not of the kind that were apt to get arrested, and I deemed it better that a few guilty men should escape than that a great many innocent ones should suffer. On the 14th of August, I was ordered to send two more divisions to Buell. They were sent the same day by way of Decatur. On the 22nd, Colonel Rodney Mason surrendered Clarksville with six companies of his regiment. Colonel Mason was one of the officers who had led their regiments off the field at almost the first fire of the rebels at Shiloh. He was by nature and education a gentleman, and was terribly mortified at his action when the battle was over. He came to me with tears in his eyes and begged to be allowed to have another trial. I felt great sympathy for him, and sent him with his regiment to garrison Clarksville and Donelson. He selected Clarksville for his headquarters, 
no doubt because he regarded it as the post of danger, it being nearer the enemy. But when he was summoned to surrender by a band of guerrillas, his constitutional weakness overcame him. He inquired the number of men the enemy had, and receiving a response indicating a force greater than his own, he said if he could be satisfied of that fact, he would surrender. Arrangements were made for him to count the guerrillas, and having satisfied himself that the enemy had the greater force, he surrendered and informed his subordinate at Donelson of the fact, advising him to do the same. The guerrillas paroled their prisoners and moved upon Donelson, but the officer in command at that point marched out to meet them and drove them away. Among other embarrassments, at the time of which I now write, was the fact that the government wanted to get out all the cotton possible from the south and directed me to give every facility toward that end. Pay in gold was authorised, and stations on the Mississippi River and on the railroad in our possession had to be designated where cotton would be received. This opened to the enemy not only the means of converting cotton into money, which had a value all over the world and which they so much needed, but it afforded them means of obtaining accurate and intelligent information in regard to our position and strength. It was also demoralising to the troops. Citizens obtaining permits from the Treasury Department had to be protected within our lines and given facilities to get out cotton by which they realised enormous profits. Men who had enlisted to fight the battles of their country did not like to be engaged in protecting a traffic which went to the support of an enemy they had to fight, and the profits of which went to men who shared none of their dangers. On the 30th of August, Colonel M. D. Leggett, near Bolivar, with the 20th and 29th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, was attacked by a force supposed to be about 4,000 strong. The enemy was driven away with a loss of more than 100 men. On the 1st of September, the bridge guard at Maidon was attacked by guerrillas. The guard held the position until reinforced, when the enemy were routed leaving about 50 of their number on the field, dead or wounded, our loss being only two killed and 15 wounded. On the same day, Colonel Dennis, with a force of less than 500 infantry and two pieces of artillery, met the cavalry of the enemy in strong force, a few miles west of Medon, and drove them away with great loss. Our troops buried 179 of the enemy's dead, left upon the field. Afterwards, it was found that all the houses in the vicinity of the battlefield were turned into hospitals for the wounded. Our loss, as reported at the time, was 45 killed and wounded. On the 2nd of September, I was ordered to send more reinforcements to Buell. Jackson and Bolivar were yet threatened, but I sent the reinforcements. On the 4th, I received direct orders to send Granger's division also to Louisville, Kentucky. General Buell had left Corinth about the 10th of June to march upon Chattanooga. Bragg, who had superseded Beauregard in command, sent one division from Tupelo on the 27th of June for the same place. This gave Buell about 17 days start. If he had not been required to repair the railroad as he advanced, the march could have been made in 18 days at the outside, and Chattanooga must have been reached by the national forces before the rebels could have possibly got there. The road between Nashville and Chattanooga could easily have been put in repair by other troops, so that communication with the North would have been opened in a short time after the occupation of the place by the national troops. If Buell had been permitted to move in the first instance, with the whole of the Army of the Ohio and that portion of the Army of the Mississippi afterwards sent to him, he could have thrown four divisions from his own command along the line of road to repair and guard it. Granger's division was promptly sent on the 4th of September. I was at the station at Corinth when the troops reached that point and found General P. H. Sheridan with them. I expressed surprise at seeing him and said that I had not expected him to go. He showed decided disappointment at the prospect of being detained. I felt a little nettled at his desire to get away and did not detain him. Sheridan was a first lieutenant in the regiment in which I had served eleven years the 4th Infantry, and stationed on the Pacific coast when the war broke out. He was promoted to a captaincy in May 1861, and before the close of the year managed in some way, I do not know how, to get east. He went to Missouri, 
Halleck had known him as a very successful young officer in managing campaigns against the Indians on the Pacific coast and appointed him acting quartermaster in southwest Missouri. There was no difficulty in getting supplies forward while Sheridan served in that capacity, but he got into difficulty with his immediate superiors because of his stringent rules for preventing the use of public transportation for private purposes. He asked to be relieved from further duty in the capacity in which he was engaged, and his request was granted. When General Halleck took the field in April 1862, Sheridan was assigned to duty on his staff. During the advance on Corinth, a vacancy occurred in the colonelcy of the 2nd Michigan Cavalry. Governor Blair of Michigan telegraphed General Halleck asking him to suggest the name of a professional soldier for the vacancy, saying he would appoint a good man without reference to his state. Sheridan was named, and was so conspicuously efficient that when Corinth was reached, he was assigned to command a cavalry brigade in the Army of the Mississippi. He was in command at Boonville on the 1st of July with two small regiments, when he was attacked by a force full three times as numerous as his own. By very skilful manoeuvres and boldness of attack, he completely routed the enemy. For this, he was made a brigadier general and became a conspicuous figure in the army about Corinth. On this account, I was sorry to see him leaving me. His departure was probably fortunate, for he rendered distinguished services in his new field. Granger and Sheridan reached Louisville before Buell got there, and on the night of their arrival, Sheridan with his command threw up works around the railroad station for the defence of troops as they came from the front. At this time, September 4th, I had two divisions of the Army of the Mississippi stationed at Corinth, Rienzi, Jacinto and Danville. There were at Corinth also Davies' division and two brigades of MacArthur's, besides cavalry and artillery. This force constituted my left wing, of which Rosecrans was in command. General Ord commanded the centre, from Bethel to Humboldt on the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, and from Jackson to Bolivar, where the Mississippi Central is crossed by the Hatchie River. General Sherman commanded on the right at Memphis, with two of his brigades back at Brownsville, at the crossing of the Hatchie River by the Memphis and Ohio Railroad. This made the most convenient arrangement I could devise for concentrating all my spare forces upon any threatened point. All the troops of the command were within telegraphic communication of each other, except those under Sherman. By bringing a portion of his command to Brownsville, from which point there was a railroad and telegraph back to Memphis, communication could be had with that part of my command within a few hours by the use of couriers. In case it became necessary to reinforce Corinth, by this arrangement all the troops at Bolivar, except a small guard, could be sent by rail by the way of Jackson in less than 24 hours, while the troops from Brownsville could march up to Bolivar to take their place. On the 7th of September I learned of the advance of Van Dorn and Price, apparently upon Corinth. One division was brought from Memphis to Bolivar to meet any emergency that might arise from this move of the enemy. I was much concerned because my first duty, after holding the territory acquired within my command, was to prevent further reinforcing of Bragg in Middle Tennessee. Already the Army of Northern Virginia had defeated the army under General Pope and was invading Maryland. In the centre, General Buell was on his way to Louisville, and Bragg marching parallel to him with a large Confederate force for the Ohio River. I had been constantly called upon to reinforce Buell until at this time my entire force numbered less than 50,000 men, of all arms. This included everything from Cairo south within my jurisdiction. If I too should be driven back, the Ohio River would become the line dividing the belligerents west of the Alleghenies, while at the east the line was already farther north than when hostilities commenced at the opening of the war. It is true Nashville was never given up after its first capture, but it would have been isolated, and the garrison there would have been obliged to beat a hasty retreat if the troops in West Tennessee had been compelled to fall back. To say at the end of the second year of the war, the line dividing the contestants at the east was pushed north of Maryland, a state that had not seceded and at the west beyond Kentucky, another state which had been always loyal, would have been discouraging indeed. 
As it was, many loyal people despaired in the fall of 1862 of ever saving the Union. The administration at Washington was much concerned for the safety of the cause it held so dear. But I believe there was never a day when the President did not think that, in some way or other, a cause so just as ours would come out triumphant. Up to the 11th of September, Rosecrans still had troops on the railroad east of Corinth, but they had all been ordered in. By the 12th, all were in, except a small force under Colonel Murphy of the 8th Wisconsin. He had been detained to guard the remainder of the stores which had not yet been brought in to Corinth. On the 13th of September, General Sterling Price entered Iuka, a town about 20 miles east of Corinth on the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Colonel Murphy, with a few men, was guarding the place. He made no resistance, but evacuated the town on the approach of the enemy. I was apprehensive lest the object of the rebels might be to get troops into Tennessee to reinforce Bragg, as it was afterwards ascertained to be. The authorities at Washington, including the General-in-Chief of the Army, were very anxious, as I have said, about affairs both in East and Middle Tennessee, and my anxiety was quite as great on their account as for any danger threatening my command. I had not force enough at Corinth to attack Price even by stripping everything, and there was danger that before troops could be got from other points, he might be far on his way across the Tennessee. To prevent this, all spare forces at Bolivar and Jackson were ordered to Corinth, and cars were concentrated at Jackson for their transportation. Within 24 hours from the transmission of the order, the troops were at their destination, although there had been a delay of four hours resulting from the forward train getting off the track and stopping all the others. This gave a reinforcement of near 8,000 men, General Ord in command. General Rosecrans commanded the district of Corinth with a movable force of about 9,000, independent of the garrison deemed necessary to be left behind. It was known that General Van Dorn was about a four days' march south of us, with a large force. It might have been part of his plan to attack at Corinth, Price coming from the east while he came up from the south. My desire was to attack Price before Van Dorn could reach Corinth or go to his relief. General Rosecrans had previously had his headquarters at Iuka, where his command was spread out along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad eastward. While there, he had a most excellent map prepared showing all the roads and streams in the surrounding country. He was also personally familiar with the ground, so that I deferred very much to him in my plans for the approach. We had cars enough to transport all of General Ord's command, which was to go by rail to Burnsville, a point on the road about seven miles west of Iuka. From there, his troops were to march by the north side of the railroad and attack Price from the northwest, while Rosecrans was to move eastward from his position south of Corinth by way of the Jacinto Road. A small force was to hold the Jacinto Road where it turns to the northeast, while the main force moved on the Fulton Road, which comes into Iuka further east. This plan was suggested by Rosecrans. Bear Creek, a few miles to the east of the Fulton Road, is a formidable obstacle to the movement of troops in the absence of bridges, all of which, in September 1862, had been destroyed in that vicinity. The Tennessee, to the northeast, not many miles away, was also a formidable obstacle for an army followed by a pursuing force. Ord was on the northwest, and even if a rebel movement had been possible in that direction, it could have brought only temporary relief, for it would have carried Price's army to the rear of the national forces and isolated it from all support. It looked to me that if Price would remain in Iuka until we could get there, his annihilation was inevitable. On the morning of the 18th of September, General Ord moved by rail to Burnsville, and there left the cars and moved out to perform his part of the programme. He was to get as near the enemy as possible during the day and entrench himself so as to hold his position until the next morning. Rosecrans was to be up by the morning of the 19th on the two roads before described, and the attack was to be from all three quarters simultaneously. Troops enough were left at Chacinto and Rienzi to detain any cavalry that Van Dorn might send out to make a sudden dash into Corinth until I could be notified. There was a telegraph wire along the railroad, so there would be no delay in communication. 
I detained cars and locomotives enough at Burnsville to transport the whole of Ord's command at once, and if Van Dorn had moved against Corinth instead of Iuka, I could have thrown in reinforcements to the number of 7,000 or 8,000 before he could have arrived. I remained at Burnsville with a detachment of about 900 men from Ord's command and communicated with my two wings by courier. Ord met the advance of the enemy soon after leaving Burnsville. Quite a sharp engagement ensued, but he drove the rebels back with considerable loss, including one general officer killed. He maintained his position and was ready to attack by daylight the next morning. I was very much disappointed at receiving a dispatch from Rosecrans after midnight from Jacinto, 22 miles from Yucca, saying that some of his command had been delayed and that the rear of his column was not yet up as far as Jacinto. He said, however, that he would still be at Ayuka by two o'clock the next day. I did not believe this possible because of the distance and the condition of the roads, which was bad. Besides, troops after a forced march of twenty miles are not in a good condition for fighting the moment they get through. It might do in marching to relieve a beleaguered garrison, but not to make an assault. I immediately sent Ord a copy of Rosecrans' dispatch and ordered him to be in readiness to attack the moment he heard the sound of guns to the south or southeast. He was instructed to notify his officers to be on the alert for any indications of battle. During the 19th, the wind blew in the wrong direction to transmit sound either towards the point where Ord was or to Burnsville, where I had remained. A couple of hours before dark on the 19th, Rosecrans arrived with the head of his column at Garnets, the point where the Jacinto Road to Iuka leaves the road going east. He here turned north without sending any troops to the Fulton Road. While still moving in column up the Jacinto Road, he met a force of the enemy and had his advance badly beaten and driven back upon the main road. In this short engagement, his loss was considerable for the number engaged, and one battery was taken from him. The wind was still blowing hard and in the wrong direction to transmit sounds towards either Ord or me. Neither he nor I nor anyone in either command heard a gun that was fired upon the battlefield. After the engagement, Rosecrantz sent me a dispatch announcing the result. This was brought by a courier. There was no road between Burnsville and the position then occupied by Rosecrans, and the country was impassable for a man on horseback. The courier bearing the message was compelled to move west nearly to Jacinto before he found a road leading to Burnsville. This made it a late hour of the night before I learned of the battle that had taken place during the afternoon. I at once notified Ord of the fact and ordered him to attack early in the morning. The next morning Rosecrans himself renewed the attack and went into Ayuka with but little resistance. Ord also went in according to orders, without hearing a gun from the south of town, but supposing the troops coming from the southwest must be up by that time. Rosecrans, however, had put no troops upon the Fulton Road, and the enemy had taken advantage of this neglect and retreated by that road during the night. Word was soon brought to me that our troops were in Iuka. I immediately rode into town and found that the enemy was not being pursued even by the cavalry. I ordered pursuit by the whole of Rosecrans' command and went on with him a few miles in person. He followed only a few miles after I left him and then went into camp, and the pursuit was continued no further. I was disappointed at the result of the Battle of Iuka, but I had so high an opinion of General Rosecrans that I found no fault at the time. On the 19th of September, General G. O. H. Thomas was ordered east to reinforce Buell, this threw the army at my command still more on the defensive. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad was abandoned except at Corinth, and small forces were left at Chihuahua and Grand Junction. Soon afterwards, the latter of these two places was given up, and Bolivar became our most advanced position on the Mississippi Central Railroad. Our cavalry was kept well to the front, and frequent expeditions were sent out to watch the movements of the enemy. We were in a country where nearly all the people, except the Negroes, were hostile to us and friendly to the cause we were trying to suppress. It was easy, therefore, for the enemy to get early information of our every move. We, on the contrary, had to go after our information in force, and then often returned without it. On the 22nd, 
Bolivar was threatened by a large force from south of Grand Junction, supposed to be 20 regiments of infantry with cavalry and artillery. I reinforced Bolivar and went to Jackson in person to superintend the movement of troops to whatever point the attack might be made upon. The troops from Corinth were brought up in time to repel the threatened movement without a battle. Our cavalry followed the enemy south of Davis's Mills in Mississippi. On the 30th, I found that Van Dorn was apparently endeavouring to strike the Mississippi River above Memphis. At the same time, other points within my command were so threatened that it was impossible to concentrate a force to drive him away. There was at this juncture a large Union force at Helena, Arkansas, which, had it been within my command, I could have ordered across the river to attack and break up the Mississippi Central Railroad far to the south. This would not only have called Van Dorn back, but would have compelled the retention of a large rebel force far to the south to prevent a repetition of such raids on the enemy's line of supplies. Geographical lines between the commands during the rebellion were not always well chosen, or they were too rigidly adhered to. Van Dorn did not attempt to get upon the line above Memphis, as had apparently been his intention. He was simply covering a deeper design, one much more important to his cause. By the 1st of October it was fully apparent that Corinth was to be attacked with great force and determination, and that Van Dorn, Lovell, Price, Vilpig and Rust had joined their strength for this purpose. There was some skirmishing outside of Corinth with the advance of the enemy on the Thrody. The rebels massed in the northwest angle of the Memphis and Charleston and the Mobile and Ohio Railroads, and were thus between the troops at Corinth and all possible reinforcements. Any fresh troops for us must come by a circuitous route. On the night of the 3rd, accordingly, I ordered General McPherson, who was at Jackson, to join Rosecrans at Corinth with reinforcements picked up along the line of the railroad equal to a brigade. Hurlbut had been ordered from Bolivar to march for the same destination, and as Van Dorn was coming upon Corinth from the northwest, some of his men fell in with the advance of Hurlbut's, and some skirmishing ensued on the evening of the 3rd. On the 4th, Van Dorn made a dashing attack, hoping, no doubt, to capture Rosecrans before his reinforcements could come up. In that case, the enemy himself could have occupied the defences of Corinth and held at bay all the Union troops that arrived. In fact, he could have taken the offensive against the reinforcements with three or four times their number, and still left a sufficient garrison in the works about Corinth to hold them. He came near success some of his troops penetrating the national lines at least once, but the works that were built after Halleck's departure enabled Rosecrans to hold his position until the troops of both McPherson and Hurlbut approached towards the rebel front and rear. The enemy was finally driven back with great slaughter. All their charges, made with great gallantry, were repulsed. The loss on our side was heavy, but nothing to compare with Van Dorn's. McPherson came up with the train of cars bearing his command as close to the enemy as was prudent, debarked on the rebel flank and got into the support of Rosecrans just after the repulse. His approach, as well as that of Hurlbut, was known to the enemy and had a moral effect. General Rosecrans, however, failed to follow up the victory, although I had given specific orders in advance of the battle for him to pursue the moment the enemy was repelled. He did not do so, and I repeated the order after the battle. In the first order, he was notified that the force of 4,000 men which was going to his assistance would be in great peril if the enemy was not pursued. General Ord had joined Hurlbut on the 4th, and being senior, took command of his troops. This force encountered the head of Van Dorn's retreating column, just as it was crossing the Hatchie by a bridge some ten miles out from Corinth. The bottom land here was swampy and bad for the operations of troops, making a good place to get an enemy into. Ord attacked the troops that had crossed the bridge and drove them back in a panic. Many were killed and others were drowned by being pushed off the bridge in their hurried retreat. Ord followed and met the main force. He was too weak in numbers to assault, but he held the bridge and compelled the enemy to resume his retreat by another bridge higher up the stream. Ord was wounded in this engagement, and the command devolved on Hurlbut. Rosecrans did not start in pursuit till the morning of the 5th, and then took the wrong road. 
Moving in the enemy's country, he travelled with a wagon train to carry his provisions and munitions of war. His march was therefore slower than that of the enemy, who was moving towards his supplies. Two or three hours of pursuit on the day of battle, without anything except what the men carried on their persons, would have been worth more than any pursuit. Commenced the next day could have possibly been. Even when he did start, if Rosecrans had followed the route taken by the enemy, he would have come upon Van Dorn in a swamp with a stream in front and Ord holding the only bridge. But he took the road leading north and towards Chihuahua instead of west, and after having marched as far as the enemy had moved to get to the Hatchie, he was as far from battle as when he started. Hurlbut had not the numbers to meet any such force as Van Dorn's if they had been in any mood for fighting, and he might have been in great peril. I now regarded the time to accomplish anything by pursuit as past, and, after Rosecrantz reached Jonesboro, I ordered him to return. He kept on to Ripley, however, and was persistent in wanting to go farther. I thereupon ordered him to halt and submitted the matter to the General-in-Chief, who allowed me to exercise my judgment in the matter, but inquired, Why not pursue? Upon this I ordered Rosecrantz back. Had he gone much farther, he would have met a greater force than Van Dorn had at Corinth, and behind entrenchments or on chosen ground, and the probabilities are he would have lost his army. The Battle of Corinth was bloody, our loss being 315 killed, 1812 wounded, and 232 missing. The enemy lost many more. Rosecrans reported 1,423 dead and 2,225 prisoners. We fought behind breastworks, which accounts in some degree for the disparity. Among the killed on our side was General Hackelman. General Oglesby was badly, it was for some time supposed mortally, wounded. I received a congratulatory letter from the President, which expressed also his sorrow for the losses. This battle was recognised by me as being a decided victory, though not so complete as I had hoped for, nor nearly so complete as I now think was within the easy grasp of the commanding officer at Corinth. Since the war, it is known that the result, as it was, was a crushing blow to the enemy, and felt by him much more than it was appreciated at the North. The battle relieved me from any further anxiety for the safety of the territory within my jurisdiction, and soon after receiving reinforcements, I suggested to the General-in-Chief a forward movement against Vicksburg. On the 23rd of October, I learned of Pemberton's being in command at Holly Springs and much reinforced by conscripts and troops from Alabama and Texas. The same day, General Rosecrans was relieved from duty with my command, and shortly after he succeeded Buell in the command of the army in Middle Tennessee. I was delighted at the promotion of General Rosecrans to a separate command, because I still believed that when independent of an immediate superior, the qualities which I at that time credited him with possessing would show themselves. As a subordinate I found that I could not make him do as I wished, and had determined to relieve him from duty that very day. At the close of the operations, just described my force, in round numbers, was 48,500. Of these, 4,800 were in Kentucky and Illinois, 7,000 in Memphis, 19,200 from Mound City South, and 17,500 at Corinth. General McClernand had been authorised from Washington to go north and organise troops to be used in opening the Mississippi. These new levies, with other reinforcements, now began to come in. On the 25th of October, I was placed in command of the Department of the Tennessee. Reinforcements continued to come from the north, and by the 2nd of November I was prepared to take the initiative. This was a great relief after the two and a half months of continued defence over a large district of country, and where nearly every citizen was an enemy ready to give information of our every move. I have described very imperfectly a few of the battles and skirmishes that took place during this time. To describe all would take more space than I can allot to the purpose, to make special mention of all the officers and troops who distinguish themselves would take a volume. Vicksburg was important to the enemy because it occupied the first high ground coming close to the river below Memphis. From there a railroad runs east, connecting with other roads leading to all points of the southern states. 
A railroad also starts from the opposite side of the river, extending west as far as Shreveport, Louisiana. Vicksburg was the only channel, at the time of the events of which this chapter treats, connecting the parts of the Confederacy divided by the Mississippi. So long as it was held by the enemy, the free navigation of the river was prevented, hence its importance. Points on the river between Vicksburg and Port Hudson were held as dependencies, but their fall was sure to follow the capture of the former place. The campaign against Vicksburg commenced on the 2nd of November, as indicated in a dispatch to the General-in-Chief in the following words. I have commenced a movement on Grand Junction, with three divisions from Corinth and two from Bolivar. We'll leave here, Jackson, Tennessee, tomorrow, and take command in person. If found practicable, I will go to Holly Springs, and maybe Grenada, completing railroad and telegraph as I go. At this time, my command was holding the Mobile and Ohio Railroad from about 25 miles south of Corinth, north to Columbus, Kentucky, the Mississippi Central from Bolivar north to its junction with the Mobile and Ohio, the Memphis and Charleston from Corinth east to Bear Creek, and the Mississippi River from Cairo to Memphis. My entire command was no more than was necessary to hold these lines, and hardly that if kept on the defensive. By moving against the enemy and into his unsubdued or not yet captured territory, driving their army before us, these lines would nearly hold themselves, thus affording a large force for field operations. My moving force at that time was about 30,000 men, and I estimated the enemy confronting me under Pemberton at about the same number. General McPherson commanded my left wing and General C.S. Hamilton the centre, while Sherman was at Memphis with the right wing. Pemberton was fortified at the Tallahatchie, but occupied Holly Springs and Grand Junction on the Mississippi Central Railroad. On the 8th we occupied Grand Junction and Lagrange, throwing a considerable force seven or eight miles south along the line of the railroad. The road from Bolivar forward was repaired and put in running order as the troops advanced. Up to this time it had been regarded as an axiom in war that large bodies of troops must operate from a base of supplies which they always covered and guarded in all forward movements. There was delay, therefore, in repairing the road back and in gathering and forwarding supplies to the front. By my orders, and in accordance with previous instructions from Washington, all the forage within reach was collected under the supervision of the chief quartermaster and the provisions under the chief commissary, receipts being given when there was anyone to take them, the supplies in any event to be accounted for as government stores. The stock was bountiful, but still it gave me no idea of the possibility of supplying a moving column in an enemy's country from the country itself. It was at this point, probably, where the first idea of a Freedmen's Bureau took its origin. Orders of the government prohibited the expulsion of the Negroes from the protection of the army when they came in voluntarily. Humanity forbade allowing them to starve. With such an army of them, of all ages and both sexes, as had congregated about Grand Junction, amounting to many thousands, it was impossible to advance. There was no special authority for feeding them, unless they were employed as teamsters, cooks and pioneers with the army, but only able-bodied young men were suitable for such work. This labour would support but a very limited percentage of them. The plantations were all deserted, the cotton and corn were ripe. Men, women and children above ten years of age could be employed in saving these crops. To do this work with contrabands, or to have it done, organisation under a competent chief was necessary. On inquiring for such a man, Chaplain Eaton, now and for many years the very able United States Commissioner of Education, was suggested. He proved as efficient in that field as he has since done in his present one. I gave him all the assistance and guards he called for. We together fixed the prices to be paid for the Negro labour, whether rendered to the government or to individuals. The cotton was to be picked from abandoned plantations, the labourers to receive the stipulated price, my recollection is twelve and a half cents per pound for picking and ginning, from the quartermaster, he shipping the cotton north to be sold for the benefit of the government. 
Citizens remaining on their plantations were allowed the privilege of having their crops saved by freedmen on the same terms. At once the freedmen became self-sustaining. The money was not paid to them directly, but was expended judiciously and for their benefit. They gave me no trouble afterwards. Later the freedmen were engaged in cutting wood along the Mississippi River to supply the large number of steamers on that stream. A good price was paid for chopping wood used for the supply of government steamers, steamers chartered and which the government had to supply with fuel. Those supplying their own fuel paid a much higher price. In this way a fund was created not only sufficient to feed and clothe all, old and young, male and female, but to build them comfortable cabins, hospitals for the sick, and to supply them with many comforts they had never known before. At this stage of the campaign against Vicksburg, I was very much disturbed by newspaper rumours that General McClernand was to have a separate and independent command within mine, to operate against Vicksburg by way of the Mississippi River. Two commanders on the same field are always one too many, and in this case I did not think the general selected had either the experience or the qualifications to fit him for so important a position. I feared for the safety of the troops entrusted to him, especially as he was to raise new levies, raw troops, to execute so important a trust. But on the 12th I received a dispatch from General Halleck saying that I had command of all the troops sent to my department and authorising me to fight the enemy where I pleased. The next day my cavalry was in Holly Springs and the enemy fell back south of the Tallahatchie. Holly Springs I selected for my depot of supplies and munitions of war, all of which at that time came by rail from Columbus, Kentucky, except the few stores collected about La Grange and Grand Junction. This was a long line, increasing in length as we moved south, to maintain in an enemy's country. On the 15th of November, while I was still at Holly Springs, I sent word to Sherman to meet me at Columbus. We were but 47 miles apart, yet the most expeditious way for us to meet was for me to take the rail to Columbus and Sherman a steamer for the same place. At that meeting, besides talking over my general plans, I gave him his orders to join me with two divisions and to march them down the Mississippi Central Railroad if he could. Sherman, who was always prompt, was up by the 29th to Cottage Hill, ten miles north of Oxford. He brought three divisions with him, leaving a garrison of only four regiments of infantry, a couple of pieces of artillery and a small detachment of cavalry. Further reinforcements he knew were on their way from the north to Memphis. About this time, General Halleck ordered troops from Helena, Arkansas, territory west of the Mississippi was not under my command then, to cut the road in Pemberton's rear. The expedition was under Generals Hovey and C.C. Washburn, and was successful so far as reaching the railroad was concerned, but the damage done was very slight and was soon repaired. The Tallahatchie, which confronted me, was very high, the railroad bridge destroyed and Pemberton strongly fortified on the south side. A crossing would have been impossible in the presence of an enemy. I sent the cavalry higher up the stream and they secured a crossing. This caused the enemy to evacuate their position, which was possibly accelerated by the expedition of Hovey and Washburn. The enemy was followed as far south as Oxford by the main body of troops and some 17 miles farther by McPherson's command. Here the pursuit was halted to repair the railroad from the Tallahatchie northward in order to bring up supplies. The piles on which the railroad bridge rested had been left standing. The work of constructing a roadway for the troops was but a short matter and, later, rails were laid for cars. During the delay at Oxford in repairing railroads, I learned that an expedition down the Mississippi now was inevitable and, desiring to have a competent commander in charge, I ordered Sherman on the 8th of December back to Memphis to take charge. The following were his orders. Headquarters, 13th Army Corps, Department of the Tennessee. Oxford, Mississippi, December 8th, 1862. Major General W.T. Sherman, Commanding Right Wing. You will proceed, with as little delay as possible, to Memphis, Tennessee, taking with you one division of your present command. On your arrival at Memphis, you will assume command of all the troops there, and that portion of General Curtis's forces at present east of the Mississippi River, 
and organize them into brigades and divisions in your own army. As soon as possible, move with them down the river to the vicinity of Vicksburg, and with the cooperation of the gunboat fleet under command of Flag Officer Porter, proceed to the reduction of that place in such a manner as circumstances and your own judgment may dictate. The amount of rations, forage, land transportation, etc., necessary to take, will be left entirely with yourself. The quartermaster at St. Louis will be instructed to send you transportation for 30,000 men. Should you still find yourself deficient, your quartermaster will be authorised to make up the deficiency from such transports as may come into the port of Memphis. On arriving in Memphis, put yourself in communication with Admiral Porter and arrange with him for his cooperation. Inform me at the earliest practicable day of the time when you will embark and such plans as may then be matured. I will hold the forces here in readiness to cooperate with you in such manner as the movements of the enemy may make necessary. Leave the district of Memphis in the command of an efficient officer, and with a garrison of four regiments of infantry, the siege guns, and whatever cavalry may be there. U.S. Grant, Major General. This idea had presented itself to my mind earlier, for on the 3rd of December I asked Halleck if it would not be well to hold the enemy south of the Yalabusha and move a force from Helena and Memphis on Vicksburg. On the 5th again I suggested, from Oxford to Halleck, that if the Helena troops were at my command, I thought it would be possible to take them and the Memphis forces south of the mouth of the Yazoo River, and thus secure Vicksburg and the state of Mississippi. Halleck, on the same day, the 5th of December, directed me not to attempt to hold the country south of the Tallahatchie, but to collect 25,000 troops at Memphis by the 20th for the Vicksburg expedition. I sent Sherman with two divisions at once, informed the General-in-Chief of the fact, and asked whether I should command the expedition down the river myself or send Sherman. I was authorised to do as I thought best for the accomplishment of the great object in view. I sent Sherman and so informed General Halleck. As stated, my action in sending Sherman back was expedited by a desire to get him in command of the forces separated from my direct supervision. I feared that delay might bring McClernand, who was his senior and who had authority from the President and Secretary of War, to exercise that particular command, and independently. I doubted McClernand's fitness, and I had good reason to believe that in forestalling him, I was by no means giving offence to those whose authority to command was above both him and me. Neither my orders to General Sherman, nor the correspondence between us or between General Halleck and myself, contemplated at the time my going further south than the Yalabusha. Pemberton's force in my front was the main part of the garrison of Vicksburg, as the force with me was the defence of the territory held by us in West Tennessee and Kentucky. I hoped to hold Pemberton in my front while Sherman should get in his rear and into Vicksburg. The further north the enemy could be held, the better. It was understood, however, between General Sherman and myself that our movements were to be cooperative. If Pemberton could not be held away from Vicksburg, I was to follow him. But at that time it was not expected to abandon the railroad north of the Yalabusha. With that point as a secondary base of supplies, the possibility of moving down the Yazoo until communications could be opened with the Mississippi was contemplated. It was my intention, and so understood by Sherman and his command, that if the enemy should fall back, I would follow him even to the gates of Vicksburg. I intended in such an event to hold the road to Grenada on the Yalabusha and cut loose from there, expecting to establish a new base of supplies on the Yazoo or at Vicksburg itself, with Grenada to fall back upon in case of failure. It should be remembered that at the time I speak of it had not been demonstrated that an army could operate in an enemy's territory depending upon the country for supplies. A halt was called at Oxford with the advance 17 miles south of there to bring up the road to the latter point and to bring supplies of food, forage and munitions to the front. On the 18th of December I received orders from Washington to divide my command into four army corps, with General McClernand to command one of them and to be assigned to that part of the army which was to operate down the Mississippi. This interfered with my plans, but probably resulted in my ultimately taking the command in person. 
McClernand was at that time in Springfield, Illinois. The order was obeyed without any delay. Dispatches were sent to him the same day in conformity. On the 20th, General Van Dorn appeared at Holly Springs, my secondary base of supplies, captured the garrison of 1,500 men commanded by Colonel Murphy of the 8th Wisconsin Regiment, and destroyed all our munitions of war, food and forage. The capture was a disgraceful one to the officer commanding, but not to the troops under him. At the same time, Forrest got on our line of railroad between Jackson, Tennessee and Columbus, Kentucky, doing much damage to it. This cut me off from all communication with the North for more than a week, and it was more than two weeks before rations or forage could be issued from stores obtained in the regular way. This demonstrated the impossibility of maintaining so long a line of road over which to draw supplies for an army moving in an enemy's country. I determined, therefore, to abandon my campaign into the interior with Columbus as a base, and returned to Lagrange and Grand Junction, destroying the road to my front and repairing the road to Memphis, making the Mississippi River the line over which to draw supplies. Pemberton was falling back at the same time. The moment I received the news of Van Dorn's success, I sent the cavalry at the front back to drive him from the country. He had start enough to move north, destroying the railroad in many places, and to attack several small garrisons entrenched as guards to the railroad. All these he found warned of his coming and prepared to receive him. Van Dorn did not succeed in capturing a single garrison except the one at Holly Springs, which was larger than all the others attacked by him put together. Murphy was also warned of Van Dorn's approach, but made no preparations to meet him. He did not even notify his command. Colonel Murphy was the officer who, two months before, had evacuated Ayuka on the approach of the enemy. General Rosecrans denounced him for the act and desired to have him tried and punished. I sustained the colonel at the time because his command was a small one compared with that of the enemy, not one-tenth as large, and I thought he had done well to get away without falling into their hands. His leaving large stores to fall into Price's possession, I looked upon as an oversight and excused it on the ground of inexperience in military matters. He should, however, have destroyed them. This last surrender demonstrated to my mind that Rosecrans' judgment of Murphy's conduct at Iuka was correct. The surrender of Holly Springs was most reprehensible and showed either the disloyalty of Colonel Murphy to the cause which he professed to serve, or gross cowardice. After the war was over, I read from the diary of a lady who accompanied General Pemberton in his retreat from the Tallahatchie, that the retreat was almost a panic. The roads were bad and it was difficult to move the artillery and trains. Why there should have been a panic I do not see. No expedition had yet started down the Mississippi River. Had I known the demoralised condition of the enemy, or the fact that central Mississippi abounded so in all army supplies, I would have been in pursuit of Pemberton while his cavalry was destroying the roads in my rear. After sending cavalry to drive Van Dorn away, my next order was to dispatch all the wagons we had under proper escort, to collect and bring in all supplies of forage and food from a region of 15 miles east and west of the road from our front back to Grand Junction, leaving two months' supplies for the families of those whose stores were taken. I was amazed at the quantity of supplies the country afforded. It showed that we could have subsisted off the country for two months instead of two weeks without going beyond the limits designated. This taught me a lesson which was taken advantage of later in the campaign, when our army lived twenty days with the issue of only five days' rations by the commissary. Our loss of supplies was great at Holly Springs, but it was more than compensated for by those taken from the country and by the lesson taught. The news of the capture of Holly Springs and the destruction of our supplies caused much rejoicing among the people remaining in Oxford. They came with broad smiles on their faces, indicating intense joy, to ask what I was going to do now without anything for my soldiers to eat. I told them that I was not disturbed, that I had already sent troops and wagons to collect all the food and forage they could find for fifteen miles on each side of the road. Countenances soon changed, and so did the inquiry. The next was, 
what are we to do? My response was that we had endeavoured to feed ourselves from our own northern resources while visiting them, but their friends in Grey had been uncivil enough to destroy what we had brought along, and it could not be expected that men with arms in their hands would starve in the midst of plenty. I advised them to emigrate east or west fifteen miles and assist in eating up what we left. This interruption in my communications north, I was really cut off from communication with a great part of my own command during this time, resulted in Sherman's moving from Memphis before McClernand could arrive, for my dispatch of the 18th did not reach McClernand. Pemberton got back to Vicksburg before Sherman got there. The rebel positions were on a bluff on the Yazoo River, some miles above its mouth. The waters were high so that the bottoms were generally overflowed, leaving only narrow causeways of dry land between points of debarkation and the high bluffs. These were fortified and defended at all points. The rebel position was impregnable against any force that could be brought against its front. Sherman could not use one-fourth of his force. His efforts to capture the city or the high ground north of it were necessarily unavailing. Sherman's attack was very unfortunate, but I had no opportunity of communicating with him after the destruction of the road and telegraph to my rear on the 20th. He did not know but what I was in the rear of the enemy, and depending on him to open a new base of supplies for the troops with me. I had, before he started from Memphis, directed him to take with him a few small steamers suitable for the navigation of the Yazoo, not knowing but that I might want them to supply me after cutting loose from my base at Grenada. On the 23rd, I removed my headquarters back to Holly Springs. The troops were drawn back gradually, but without haste or confusion, finding supplies abundant and no enemy following. The road was not damaged south of Holly Springs by Van Dorn, at least not to an extent to cause any delay. As I had resolved to move headquarters to Memphis and to repair the road to that point, I remained at Holly Springs until this work was completed. On the 10th of January, the work on the road from Holly Springs to Grand Junction and thence to Memphis being completed, I moved my headquarters to the latter place. During the campaign here described, the losses, mostly captures, were about equal, crediting the rebels with their Holly Springs capture, which they could not hold. <laughs> encountered until the gunboats and transports were within range of the fort. After three days' bombardment by the Navy, an assault was made by the troops and Marines, resulting in the capture of the place and in taking 5,000 prisoners and 17 guns. I was at first disposed to disapprove of this move as an unnecessary side movement having no especial bearing upon the work before us, but when the result was understood, I regarded it as very important 5,000 Confederate troops left in the rear might have caused us much trouble and loss of property while navigating the Mississippi. Immediately after the reduction of Arkansas Post and the capture of the garrison, McClernand returned with his entire force to Napoleon at the mouth of the Arkansas River. From here I received messages from both Sherman and Admiral Porter, urging me to come and take command in person 
and expressing their distrust of McClernand's ability and fitness for so important and intricate an expedition. On the 17th, I visited McClernand and his command at Napoleon. It was here made evident to me that both the army and navy were so distrustful of McClernand's fitness to command that while they would do all they could to ensure success, this distrust was an element of weakness. It would have been criminal to send troops under these circumstances into such danger. By this time I had received authority to relieve McClernand, or to assign any other person to the command of the river expedition, or to assume command in person. I felt great embarrassment about McClernand. He was the senior major general after myself within the department. It would not do with his rank and ambition to assign a junior over him. Nothing was left, therefore, but to assume the command myself. I would have been glad to put Sherman in command to give him an opportunity to accomplish what he had failed in December before, but there seemed no other way out of the difficulty, for he was junior to McClernand. Sherman's failure needs no apology. On the 20th, I ordered General McClernand with the entire command to Young's Point and Millican's Bend, while I returned to Memphis to make all the necessary preparations for leaving the territory behind me secure. General Hurlbut with the 16th Corps was left in command. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad was held, while the Mississippi Central was given up. Columbus was the only point between Cairo and Memphis on the river, left with a garrison. All the troops and guns from the posts on the abandoned railroad and river were sent to the front. On the 29th of January, I arrived at Young's Point and assumed command the following day. General McClernand took exception in a most characteristic way, for him. His correspondence with me on the subject was more in the nature of a reprimand than a protest. It was highly insubordinate, but I overlooked it, as I believed, for the good of the service. General McClernand was a politician of very considerable prominence in his state. He was a member of Congress when the Secession War broke out. He belonged to that political party which furnished all the opposition there was to a vigorous prosecution of the war for saving the Union. There was no delay in his declaring himself for the Union at all hazards, and there was no uncertain sound in his declaration of where he stood in the contest before the country. He also gave up his seat in Congress to take the field in defence of the principles he had proclaimed. The real work of the campaign and siege of Vicksburg now began. The problem was to secure a footing upon dry ground on the east side of the river from which the troops could operate against Vicksburg. The Mississippi River from Cairo south runs through a rich alluvial valley of many miles in width, bound on the east by land running from 80 up to two or more hundred feet above the river. On the west side, the highest land, except in a few places, is but little above the highest water. Through this valley, the river meanders in the most tortuous way, varying in direction to all points of the compass. At places, it runs to the very foot of the bluffs. After leaving Memphis, there are no such highlands coming to the water's edge on the east shore until Vicksburg is reached. The intervening land is cut up by bayous filled from the river in high water, many of them navigable for steamers. All of them would be except for overhanging trees, narrowness and tortuous course, making it impossible to turn the bends with vessels of any considerable length. Marching across this country in the face of an enemy was impossible. Navigating it proved equally impracticable. The strategic way according to the rule, therefore, would have been to go back to Memphis, establish that as a base of supplies, fortify it so that the storehouses could be held by a small garrison and move from there along the line of railroad repairing as we advanced to the Yalabusha or to Jackson, Mississippi.